Welcome to the virtual lunch. Today is Friday, June 19. This is the 70th virtual lunch. I'm honored that Hal Viegas is, uh, is our special guest and has joined us today. In 2002, I was at the NBA Players Association uh, as um, serving as Deputy General Counsel. I'd started there in 1997. Very interesting times at the Players Association in those years. We had a collective bargaining agreement negotiation that was really contentious, led to a half-season-long lockout in 1999. We had a bunch of major litigations built around player discipline issues. Basketball fans, these will all be walks down memory lane. Uh, the Latrell Sprewell case where Latrell attacked his coach at the time, P.J. Carlissimo, and was suspended and, and terminated by the team in the league. We also had the Detroit Pistons brawl in a, at a game at the Palace. There were a lot of suspensions and punishments to players that occurred out of that case, and we represented the players in that situation as well. We had another collective bargaining agreement negotiation in 2005. I was also around for the formation and served as a general counsel of WNBA Players Association during that whole time, negotiated the first collective bargaining agreement in women's sports negotiated two other WNBA agreements. After 12 years at the Players Association, I was offered a job um, at Wasserman Media Group to work for one of the preeminent agents in, in professional sports, Arn Tellum, to come in as his chief operating officer of the athlete management group at Wasserman. It was a great opportunity, great role. Uh, I went and served as COO of I oversaw the agents who represented athletes across four sports, basketball, baseball, football, and Olympic sports. I oversaw the legal operations of the group, the marketing, the PR. Uh, love my time there, but my family and I, we missed New York. After uh, three years in LA, we moved back to New York where I took a job at XL Sports, uh, serving as general counsel and starting a new division at XL representing coaches, broadcasters, and front office executives in pro and college sports. Uh, I was at XL for about almost five years. In 2017, I left Excel to start my own agency, basically taking the business I had started at Excel and creating Sideline Sports Management, which I, I still run, uh, representing pro and college coaches, broadcasters, and front office executives. Shortly after leaving Excel and starting Sideline, I was approached to work with um, Riot Games, which is a developer of the League of Legends, which is one of the more, most popular, if not the most popular, uh, esport title. Uh, this was and is the first the Players Association in the esports space. So since just about three years ago, I've been um, serving as the executive director of the NALCS Players Association, representing the hundred or so players that play League of Legends professionally in North America. And I also still run Sideline. It's really no different than, than conventional sports. You know, players, athletes are the same regardless of the game they play. You know, the issues are the same. You know, you're, you're protecting player rights. You're making sure that they're being paid a fair wage, that their working conditions are appropriate. We're a trade association versus a union, so we don't have the ability to collectively bargain. In esports, you have the developer who is actually the IP right holder of the sport, of the game. These leagues don't exist without developer consent and approval. Esports, unlike traditional sports, lends itself to being online. The initial thing was no fans in the studio. Then the next move was no teams in the studio. They didn't want the teams intermingling. They were able to reconfigure so that every player could be at their own location everyone would remote into a synced broadcast and the matches took place online. So the players are playing out of their homes. In the League of Legends, four of the LCS teams are owned by NBA franchises and or NBA owners. So the original franchises were owned oftentimes by former players or people who were connected to the space. There's still a few of those legacy owners who started teams 10 years ago, 11 years ago when the, the league first started. Then you have Dan Gilbert and Madison Square Garden who own teams and everything in between. And they make money in a variety of ways, mostly through sponsorships. There's revenue that comes to the teams through Twitch. There's prize pools. All the teams are based in LA and all the players live, you know, within very close driving distance of the studio and or their team facility. Now, one league has changed that model, the Overwatch League, the Activision Blizzard League, they went to geolocating. Um, unfortunately for them, this was their inaugural season where they actually went to cities and based their teams there. And they were having competitions where a team Philadelphia would fly into Houston. 
it was an interesting idea. I think everyone in the space was excited uh, to see how the model worked, but circumstances have really uh, damaged their effort. So the average age is 20.2. So they're pretty young. Your synaptic ability to process information peaks at 21. Unfortunately, we were all deep on the downside of that. Like athleticism in traditional sports, you can make up for degradation in physical skill in other ways, experience, knowledge of strategy, chemistry, things like that. But there's also a pretty high burnout factor historically. Their schedules are really pretty crazy. This past season um, instituted some new limits on practice time, but their wow. practice days before this year would run 12, 14 hour day in wow. addition to their team meetings, their strategy sessions, et cetera. Yeah. It's becoming much more popular at the high school level. Hundreds, if not thousands of high school teams have gaming programs. And at the college level, it's very significant. There are over 300 colleges and universities across America that have gaming programs, gaming teams that compete against other colleges. Over 200 of them offer significant scholarships to players to play for their programs. Gaming is the future. So on the professional side, we're about 10 years in, but gaming's been around in some form or another for 25, 30 years. And like any other industry, there's opportunities for lawyers or, or business executives. A lot of people in the space are actual gamers in some form or another, or at least they're knowledgeable about gaming and, and esports. But anything you can think of, there's an opportunity in, in this space in the same way that there is in traditional sports. Sports oftentimes is a leader in, in creating change. Going back to the college players in the 60s who boycotted playing games against teams in the South when, you know, the black players would have to stay in a segregated hotel or couldn't travel with the team. We've seen lots of athletes do time, you know, Muhammad Ali, Bill Russell, who've been leaders in fostering change. And players currently, LeBron James is one that immediately comes to mind who's very vocal about injustices that he sees. They have a voice, they have a platform, they have an ability to influence people. You know, when they make hard choices and force people to recognize racial or social or diversity issues exist, people have to react. There's a lot of power there. And I think athletes are becoming more cognizant of that they, that they hold this power and they're driving change. You know, I think for the most part, most sports are going to try to get back to normal as fast as possible because normal means more revenue and, you know, more engagement with your fans. You know, one of the things that they, I think they have to concentrate on is keeping fans as they get older. The typical fan is in their teens to mid-20s. So, you know, I think keeping engagement, keeping fans around as they, you know, get into their 30s and 40s, making sure you keep engagement. And then just the other outcomes of growth. The next big thing is to expand their reach through broadcast. That's something that esports are looking to do, just expand beyond their core audience and to grow into new areas of potential fans. There's talk of some esports becoming Olympic sports that would obviously expand the uh, growth potential. Although I think the Olympic movement feels it needs esports more than esports feels it needs the Olympic movement. But I think there's probably a healthy marriage there at some point growing their audience and also growing their ability to develop new players. Like there's no real stratified path to professionalism. You know, you don't have developmental systems like you do in traditional sports, you know, as, as high school leagues develop and college leagues develop, you know, I think those will become pathways for players to become professionals. Fans have a voice and have an opportunity to vote with their wallets. If a league is doing the right things and promoting diversity and inclusion, if fans support those efforts and, and support those leagues, you know, those leagues will prosper and others will wither. Fans in esports are very interesting. They tend to be very loyal to the game or games that they either play or that they enjoy. You know, there are different kinds of games. There's fantasy games, there's first person shooter games, there's multiplayer online battle arena games. So a lot of people, if you're a football fan, you're probably also to some degree a baseball fan or a basketball fan. I think esport fans are less broad in their appreciation for different esports. Like they tend to just have their game and that's their game. There's less of an opportunity for them to, you know, jump from one title to another because of what one title is doing versus another not doing. But the fans always have opportunities to influence what companies do. If a company's not doing the right thing, 
the titles really listen to what the fans say if they're passionate enough about an, an issue. How dare you? I love it. <laughs>